all praises. And it's all due to the glory of God. Don't ever forget that, man. Wherever you are right now, always know that the breath in your lungs right now is given to you by God. The soul in your brain that's allowing you to talk right now is given to you by God. Every time you drink something that tastes good and you feel joy from it, that was given from God. And every time you suffer and feel pain, that was given by God. Remember that. Don't ever forget that. You know why? Because when you know that, you learn to respect Him. You learn that He holds your soul in His hand. And He could squeeze or He could caress whatever you want. Based on your actions, He will do to you. You understand? Remember that always, all glory to God, always, and there is none. Everything else is null and void. Never get upset. Never get mad. Never get to a point where you're so frustrated that you feel like you need to yell, especially if you're wearing tzitziot, and people could see them and know you're a Jew. Why? Because when you get mad, you fail, even if you're a billion percent right. Don't ever forget these lessons I'm telling you when your mouth is closed. Can never get in trouble You know when you don't keep your mouth closed When you see somebody, God forbid You see a girl, God forbid, getting raped Then you can start yelling and chasing after the guy That's not a problem You understand? But we all understand, man The little things for your own honor Be humble, let it go May my soul be like dust to all You understand? These are lessons you need to know And ingrain in your brain for eternity I spoke to you for less than two minutes and gave you enough to guide you in life for eternity, you know what I mean? Be humble. That's the message of the Torah, man, for real, man. All your Shabbatot, all your eating kosher, all your halachot that you keep, you're not a classy person. You're not getting into heaven, bro. With everything that you did, with all the mitzvot you did, if you do not keep it classy, you will never enter heaven, you understand? And if you don't do the laws and you're super classy, God will give you chances to come back to fix it. And right now we're very close to the end of the day, so this might be your last chance. So Hashem will guide you in a way that will help you to keep Shabbat. Like if I told you the Shabbat Shalom day story, <clears throat> right away you would probably keep Shabbat. But I'll tell you a better story. There was a guy... And he was a billionaire And he lived in this really expensive building in Manhattan And right outside his front door Every day when he walked on the street to go to work There was this bum begging for money And this went on for about a month and a half Till finally the guy felt bad, you know So he went to his wife He said, listen, I never give charity But, you know Maybe I should help this guy out So the wife says to him Yeah, yeah, give him some money Get him out of here I don't like seeing him so he goes down one day and he says to the guy, listen to me, bro. I never do any good deeds. <clears throat> but today I want to really do something nice for you. So here, here's a check for $7 million. Go feed your family and enjoy your life. So the guy was like, yo, thank you so much. This, that. Long story short, about two months later, this guy happened to be a very smart guy. So he invested the money, became a billionaire. So now he moved into the same building as the guy that helped him. And then fast forward a couple years later, then the guy that helped him all of a sudden ran into tremendous problems. Everything he did was cursed. All his money got lost. He got divorced. He needed to pay alimony. This and that. His reputation was smeared. Long story short, now he became homeless. And you know where he was begging for food every day? Right in front of the building. And then one day this guy comes out and sees this guy begging for food. And the guy looks at him and he said, listen, do me a favor, please, I beg you, just give me one million dollars, that's all I need. I can pay my rent, I can do some things, I can get I can get back on my feet, please, I'm begging you, help me. So the guy looked at him and said, help you, why do I need to help you? You gave me seven million dollars as a gift, now you want it back? What are you, normal? What are you, an Indian giver? Who does that? And he looked at him, spit on the floor, and continued to work. Now, I want to ask you a question, this guy spit on the floor and continue to work he's a righteous guy or a very wicked guy or very ungrateful guy so you tell me he's wicked and ungrateful and I'll tell you you're right and then I'll tell you that's you when it comes to Shabbat you know why because God gave you seven days in a week like the seven million dollars he gave him and he asked him for one million back and Hashem asked you for one day back 
and you couldn't do it, that's ungrateful. Go ask the Egyptians what happens to an ungrateful person. Scary. Ten plagues from beyond nature. Yo, what do you think? Yo, amazing. Bro, let me show you beyond nature and everyday nature that's gotten you confused that it's even nature. When it rains, that's water, right? And lightning is made of fire. So how do they coexist? That's a miracle right there. From God. God is showing you I run the world, homie. I run the world. I control everything based on how you behave. Man, if I was, I wouldn't want to ever be the prime minister of Israel, but if I was in charge, I would just tell the Jews, bro, read the Shema in English <laughs> or in Hebrew because I'll be in Israel so they probably understand what Hebrew is. You know what I mean? Over here, nobody understands Hebrew, so they read the Hebrew and they don't know what they're saying. I would say, just read the Shema. Look what it says in the Shema. If you follow me, And you do the right thing I will bless you with rain You will be fed You will be sated Your animals will have to eat Your family will be protected Your gates will be always watched over You will have security in your land Like all the blessing that comes from following God's word And if you don't Then I will quickly Throw you out from the land I've given you (laughs) Man you don't understand bro I might be going to Israel to move real soon, man. Over there, that is the epicenter of the universe. Everything emanates from there. The whole world is judged from there. You understand? That's why it says if you're going to do a sin in Israel thing, not a thousand times, a billion times. You know why? Because the land over there is holy. Even with all the impurity, it still remains the land of God. You know what that is? The land of God. Think about it, bro. That land is blessed directly from God, man. I don't know any other land like that. Show me another land that God blesses like that, bro. He doesn't. Crazy, yo. Eretz Israel, yo. And nobody even knows, bro. Most of the people there don't even have a clue. Yeah, yeah, I feel God. I feel God as he's, uh, you know, smoking a cigarette and uh, listening to music on Shabbat. But he feels God. <laughs> listen, bro. You want to feel God? Listen to his word. Then you're going to really feel him. You want to feel God? Sit all day and study about him Connect him Then you're really gonna feel him You're gonna feel him Not in your soul He's already in your soul But you're gonna feel him in your heart Cause when you take out those evil inclinations Out of your heart Your desires are in your heart Your brain is in your soul You know what I mean? Make sure that the two are pure Forever yo Remember that Get into my notes right now yo The power of a parable to move the heart is very great. We see this when the wise woman from Tekoa sought to move David to take pity on Avshalom. The story she told penetrated his heart and he immediately had his banished son returned. What's important is not riches and status, but upright qualities and righteousness and judgment. I like that. If a person sins too much, then ultimately the person will sacrifice his innocence and virtue On the altar of his desires Proverbs 119 Such are the ways Of all those greedy for gain It takes the life of its owner Only when King David said I've sinned against God Was he forgiven Because one who admits the sin And abandons it Will be forgiven I like that King David was punished Through four of his children The death of an infant uh, The death of the infant That Bathsheba bore him The shaming of Tamar The death of Ammon and later Avshalom. When a person commits injustice, he brings the evil eye upon himself. Anyone who desecrates the name of God in private will one day pay for it in public. Acham, the son of Zerach from the tribe of Judah, confessed to having transgressed the ban against taking the booty in the time of Joshua. Joshua 7.21. This was a trait that the tribe of Judah had. We saw it with Yehuda, with Tamar, and with King David. King Solomon taught... He who hides his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and desists. I like that. Show mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. Psalms 51, 6. Against you alone have I sinned and have done that which is evil in your eyes. Therefore, you are just when you speak. Someone who has relations with another man's wife gets put to death by strangulation, but is cleansed of his sins. Not so someone who shames his fellow in public. He loses his share in the world to come. Anyone who studies Torah, engages in acts of kindness, or buries a child is forgiven for all their sins. Although the death of his son caused him great pain, King David found comfort in the fact that his anguish would atone for his sin. 
King David spoke about this in Psalms 1, not, sorry, in Psalms 9, 1. The very fact that King Solomon, the wisest of all men and a ruler of Israel, came from the union of King David and Bathsheba indicated that it was God's permission that David marry her, the woman who from the beginning of creation was chosen to be his wife. As we spoke about, he took her too earlier, he made a sin, she got pregnant, he tried to hide it by bringing back Uriah from the war and trying to get him like a little bit tipsy. So he goes with his wife. He commanded him, go with your wife. He didn't want to go with his wife because he was worried about the men in battle. They used this as a pretext to say that he didn't respect the king, sent him to the front line and killed him. And King David was wrong and he got punished, lost the kid. His son rebelled against him. His daughter Tamar was raped by his other son. I mean, give me a break, bro. And you're going to tell me tragedies don't come from sins. Man, come on, man, please. Just study the Torah, man. I study the Torah a lot and I go deep. And I'm telling you, just simple lessons I learned. Be humble and don't sin. I mean, I don't understand, man. If you do those things, it's a guaranteed one trillion gazillion percent. You will go to heaven because being humble is keeping the laws. Yeah, you don't want to keep Shabbat, but you humble yourself and you do it for God. You understand? Man, you guys got to really understand what's going on, man. The heartfelt psalm David composed as a result of this incident is a very inspirational lesson for all those who have fallen and now seek their way back to God. Wow, I like that. When the prophet Jeremiah came to correct the people, <laughs> they threw him in a pit. You understand what's going on? And now I'm going to do something so beautifully to just really show you how to address the nation of Israel. We learned that Moses was called the man of God when he came to bless Israel. You understand? That's when he was considered a man of God. So it shows you that when you bless Israel, Hashem likes it a lot. So what if you see the nation doing some dirty things? So the way you say instead of saying the dirty Jews, the Jews are dirty, they're disgusting, I don't want to be associated with these people. No, that's not how you do it. Because if you do it like that, God forbid you're going to get punished for that. There's many big prophets like Elijah got punished for that. Because he said to God, yo, your children don't keep your commandments. They don't do circumcision. They left you. They dissed you. They belittle you. I mean, I'm just adding, but you get the point. After that, his prophecy was taken away. Why? Because he got mad. Could not have a prophecy and be mad. Because when you get mad or frustrated, not only do you fail, actually by failing, it means that you didn't trust God. And the whole point of the Torah is to put your ego down. Trust God and make peace. Seek peace and pursue it. But the way I say it is like this. So pay attention because it's dope. It rhymes. And it'll stick in your head like a jingle. Put your ego low. Let it go. And know that God is running the show, bro. <laughs> I like that. That's how you got to do it. They threw him in a pit. So what is it? So when you're judging the nation of Israel, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. For example... A bark mitzvah by the reform. Disgusting, desecrating God's name, and you should call it out. But with class, don't bang on the table, yelling, this is crazy, this is that. Now, in a, in a situation like that, I don't know, bro. That's, you know what? Hashem is telling me. In that situation, you can bang on the table and get upset, yes. Keep it classy. Don't say anything too overboard. Don't start cursing them that they die like a dog. And Don't do that. Don't do that. Because we learn when you curse excessively, it's going to come back to you. But I'll give you an example. There's these two Jews in Israel that are trying to take Jews away and bring them to JC. Sick. Jews for JC. One ministry nation. I don't know. Something like that. It's two Jews. Two secular Jews. Such a wise guy. Such melogin. You know, like a real wise guys. Jews, Jews. So there's this one rabbi that I really like out there. And I've listened to him maybe a couple of times because it's always in Hebrew. And my Hebrew isn't so great, so I know probably 70%. You miss 30%, you could miss a lot. So Rabbi Eitan Baghdadi, so he makes a video about them banging on the table. He's going nuts. But that doesn't bother me. When I look at that, I accept that as standing up for the name of Hashem. And I like that. So it's got to be done in a certain way. I like the way he does it, yo. I like the way he does it, yo. But at the same time, even for these two Jews... Should have mercy, but don't be your temi sadiq. Don't have mercy on those who don't have mercy on your children, Hashem. That's what Hashem taught me, not to have mercy on those that don't have mercy on his children. These two people don't have mercy on their children. How does he have mercy on God's children? He's trying to take God's children and make them idol worshippers. That's having mercy on God's children, or that's trying to murder God's children. Murder God's children. So there you go, Rav Eitan Baghdad is one billion percent right to go nuts on them. Amen. Bottom line, though, is that Listen, let me explain to you how it goes. It's so deep how it goes. 
so and they even make fun of him in the video you know like oh you need to calm down you need to take a chill pill <laughs> the demons are afoot the demons are lurking the demons have affected yo half of my nation Hassan Khalila yo you talk like that but that's a hundred percent true they're all Democrats those are that's demonic funny defund the police pro-abortion pro-gay marriage pro-everything that God hates they love it. That's not demonic, that's a demon. So what are you talking about? So some of them are lost, but the ones that are good and have some good and some bad, but overall are good people. For those you have mercy, for those you judge them favorably, for those you go out of your way for helping, for those you give them extra love. It's just like, you know, if you're running a school, here's a great question. So you're running a school and there's one kid that's horrific, that's destroying the class for everybody else. Do you get rid of this kid or do you keep the kid? At the expense of everybody else So the answer is you get rid of the kid However With the biggest however you ever saw in your life If it's in my school You use the Torah to change this kid So you don't have to get rid of nobody See this is the thing that pains my heart so much How many yeshivot have been in Where they had kids that they kick out Or were misbehaving And they, they brought a psychologist Not even religious not even religious, bro. I'm not saying that if he's religious, he's perfect. He's not. But not religious? He doesn't even have a God that he fears? Like, come on. Come on. He's going to give the kid advice? This is a joke. He learned from a book. He didn't learn from the Torah. He didn't learn from the wisdom of God. And they have the Torah right there. Right there. Like with jealousy. Jealousy. You know how many people... You... Listen, King Shaul was jealous of King David. Right there, you have a kid who's jealous of another kid and is causing problems in the school. You use that story right away. You have another story, stealing. You give him stories about stealing in the Torah. What's the punishment for stealing? I'll give you just one quick lesson I would tell the kid. I'd say, you know, when you have stolen property, God hits you direct. There's not going to be a buffer. I'll explain to you what I mean. If you have property that's yours, before God hits you, he's going to hit your property. But if the property's stolen, he's going to hit you direct. You're not going to have that security or that warning. You understand? doesn't pay the sin, my brother. I'll tell him the story about the guy who stole the car. And when he put on the, ra- the, the engine, the CD came on, talking about what happens to people in hell for stealing. The guy turned around, put the car back, left the note. I heard the CD, got nervous. Here's your car back. Thank you. <laughs> you understand? You got to use the Torah to fix the kids. They're not using the Torah to fix the kids. I don't even understand what they're teaching in some of the yeshivot. Listen, hey, yo, man, I don't want to get into it too much. Bottom line is, I begged Hashem to help me open up a school here where I live, and it didn't work out for whatever reason. So I'm going to uproot myself, go and plant myself in Eretz Israel, and I have very... A very, very, very strong, confident feeling that Hashem is going to bless me there tremendously. We learned that from Avram and Sarah when they changed their names. That's when they got a kid. <laughs> Listen, man, don't make me pour the whole Torah on your head. God forbid I talk like that, you see, because that's already, it's not bragging. That's not being like I say that with love. But I learned from King David. What did King David say? Your Torah is like a song in my mouth. No, I got punished for that. That's belittling the Torah. It's not like a song in your mouth. What are you saying? You know the Torah by heart? You don't. And you can't say I'm going to pour out the whole Torah. You don't know the whole Torah. And if you think you do know the whole Torah and you're going to brag and boast, Hashem is going to send you somebody to humble you so badly. Probably a convert that converted yesterday. And he's going to come and embarrass you in front of everybody. You know why? Because who are you to brag about your wisdom? Your wisdom was given to you by God. Let him brag about it. You don't brag. You understand? Unbelievable, bro. Just like somebody told me one time. Don't brag. Let other people brag for you. That's true. That's true. Hashem will come and say about a big tzaddik in the Torah. He was amazing. He did this right. He did that right. Everything he did was perfect. But in this, he failed. That's what makes him a God. You understand? It's true justice. Not like in the New Testament or in the uh, Quran. They'll never say anything bad about Muhammad or anything bad about JC. That's how you know it's not a real book. A real book is objective and it's going to say what it is. Psalms 144.1 Blessed is God who trains my hands for battle 
and my fingers for war. A Jew is forbidden to benefit from anything associated with the worship of idolatry. After conquering Rabbah and defeating the Amalek forces, David took revenge against them for having cruelly shamed his messengers and rejecting his kindness. The testimony of Hashem is trustworthy, which makes this simple person wise, deep. The fear of Hashem is pure. After one acquires it, it lasts forever. Let me say that again. The fear of Hashem is pure. After one acquires it, it lasts forever. Behold, the eye of Hashem watches over those who fear Him and those that hope for His kindness to release their soul from death and to keep them alive in the time of a famine. Wow, man, think what I just read. I just told you that if you fear God, He will save you in the time of a famine. Deep, deep, super deep. The angel of Hashem encamps around those who fear Him and He releases them. Fear Hashem, His holy ones, because there's no shortage of His kindness for those who fear Him. Yo, look what I'm telling you about fearing God. That's why King Solomon said, Reshit Chochmah Hashem, the foundation to spiritual wisdom. The foundation, everything. This is the nucleus, the core, the epicenter. The foundation to wisdom is to fear God. You know why? Because when you fear God, you don't sin. And when you sin, you're pure. And when you're pure, your brain will work perfect. Look at this. Look at this. Look what King David is saying, yo. Come, children, listen to me, and I shall teach you how to fear God. I mean, give me a break, bro. If this is not drilling in your head that to fear God is a noble thing, then I don't know what else to tell you. Who is the man who desires life, who loves days, and who wishes to see good rewards in the world to come? The one who keeps his tongue away from evil and his lips from speaking deceitfully. Turn away from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Let me break this down to you so deeply so you understand for eternity. Who is the man who desires life and who loves days and who wishes to see good rewards in the world to come? Who is this person? The one who keeps his tongue away from evil and his lips from speaking deceitfully. He could be the biggest Sadiq that ever lived. Big Rabbi teaches, has, I don't know, 23,000 followers on YouTube. But he talks bad about another Jew or he lets evil touch his lips. Not good. Not good, bro. That's why you always seek peace and pursue it. You know why? You know when evil touches your lips and you speak deceitfully about another person? When you're mad. When you're angry. When you hold on to some kind of anger that you can't let go. That's why every time you see him, you're going to give him an evil eye and speak bad about him. You understand? Not good, bro. Not good. I just gave you a mad secret. I hope the guy said mad. That's ironic. Mad like mad good. <laughs> That's how the kids talk. Like, you know what I mean? So let me rephrase that. I just gave you an amazing secret. The angry face of Hashem is against the evildoers to remove their memory from the face of the earth. The righteous cried out and Hashem heard and saved them from their distress. Hashem favors those who fear Him and those who hope for His kindness. Praise Hashem, O inhabitants of Jerusalem. Glorify your God, O inhabitants of Zion. David suffered many tragedies for the sin he committed with Bathsheba. So sad. I told you some of them. They were vicious. Two of them were the raping of his daughter Tamar and the killing of his son Amon by Avshalom. Why, why, why? Tamar and Avshalom were the children of Ma'acha. She was the beautiful captive woman that King David took as a wife. And then we see in the next verse after it talks about a beautiful captive woman, it talks about a rebellious son. And that's what happened. He had a son that rebelled against him, Avshalom. Achinoam was Amon's mother. Nice, I like that. David didn't rebuke his children when they needed it. And that led to the death of Amon because Avshalom got further angered when his father did nothing. King David was afraid to say anything lest the people would say Amon acted like King David because he did a sin with the woman. God exacted retribution against King David to Avshalom. He sought to usurp the throne, chased his father from Jerusalem, slept with ten of his father's concubines, and in the end he was killed. The term, and he loves her, appears twice in scripture, once in Genesis 24, 67, regarding the love that Isaac had for Rebekah, beautiful, and the second time is describing Amon's love for Tamar. 
That was his half sister. Yo, yo, yo. He's so attracted to her that he raped her. That's sick. Our sages say don't get close to an evil person, even if your intention is to draw him close to the Torah. Just shows you, bro, because evil is attached to sin. And sin is the end of you, bro. Don't you get it? When you have sins, you have death. When you have sins, you have stress. When you have sins, you have despair and destruction. You understand? Don't you understand? Proverbs 16, 29. A man of violence entices his friend and leads him on a path that's not good. Just being alone with a woman and gazing upon her beauty is forbidden. Rather than satisfying the evil inclination, such familiarity and closeness arouses one to greater passions and desires. Deep. This is why you should not enjoy from the beauty of a woman that's not yours. Our sages say that strife in a person's home brings greater anguish than World War III, Gog and Magog. Think about that. Your fighting in a person's home will bring more anguish and strife than Gog and Magog. Bro, that is an amazing, amazing analogy to really show you. That's not hyperbolic, yo. They're letting you know. Worse than World War III. Wow, wow, wow. Because when family hurts family, that's when it gets deep. Yoav made peace between Avshalom and David. And Avshalom was ungrateful to Yoav. He tried to help him. Avshalom rebelled and undermined the authority of King David. One of the ways deceitful people trick you is by making a lot of promises that they know they cannot keep. When litigants come before a judge, he's to view both parties as culpable. During the period between the destruction of the tabernacle in Shiloh and the building of the first temple in Jerusalem, it was permitted to sacrifice on a private altar anywhere. When somebody is leaving you, don't tell them go in peace. Say go to peace. We learned this from when King David said to Avshalom, said that to Avshalom, afterwards he encountered death. Let's say that again. When somebody is leaving you, don't tell them go in peace. No, say go to peace. Hushia was King David's friend and was also a servant from the royal house. David told him to go to Avshalom and tell him that he was with him and this way he would be able to find out his innermost secrets like a spy. When King David was on the run, he remembered what the prophet Nathan told him. Behold, I shall bring forth evil against you out of your own house in front of your eyes while I take your wives and give them to the one close to you and he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Second book of Samuel 12, 11. Read it. I feel like this is the perfect way to describe my building where I live. It was clear that once the evil had begun, it would not cease until it ran its course so deep. The reason why King David did not fight Avshalom because when he realized that God was punishing him for his misdeeds, he immediately accepted God's judgment and did nothing to prevent Avshalom from seizing the throne. That's so deep. Eli, a descendant of Itamar, son of Aaron, was told that the position of high priest will one day be removed from his descendants and given over to another priestly line, the descendants of Pinchas, the son of Aaron, son of Alazar. First book of Samuel 2.30 to 2.35. This is in fulfillment of the verse that says, Therefore I have given him my covenant of peace. This shall be a covenant of eternal priesthood to him and his descendants after him. Numbers 25, 12, and 13. Cursing anyone is never allowed because it shows that you got angry. The best thing to do is just say, God, please make justice and let Hashem do the cursing. Sometimes when you curse, it could be excessive like when King David did. And God forbid, it could come back and be a punishment on your kids, God forbid. Achitofa would call upon his unparalleled wisdom and astuteness when formulating advice. David was afraid of Achitofa because he knew a lot of his innermost secrets. David said, it's not an enemy who rails against me. It's not my foe who raises himself against me. But it is you, a man of my equal, a close friend, and my companion. Psalms 55, 2, 13, and 14. King David told Solomon, Remember when Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahurim, cursed me with a vicious curse on the day I went to Machanaim? The word used for vicious is Nimrezet. It was an acronym for adulterer, a legitimate rasha, tormentor, and an abomination. Shimei accused the king David accused King David of being all these things. Shimei, son of Gera, was actually King Solomon's teacher. He was extremely knowledgeable in Torah. Wow, that's deep. The word cursing 
who Michalel only appears twice in the scripture here in the second book of Samuel 16 5 and Exodus 21 17 where it talks about how a son cursing his mother and father deserves death in Exodus it appears at the head of the verse and in the book of Samuel at the end you know why to teach us that Shimi was the head of the Sanhedrin but in the end because he cursed he was killed Wow, when a person is unable to overcome a stronger enemy, he should never punish a weaker one. You know why? Because doing so will only bring him disgrace. Probably what's going to happen to Putin right now in Russia. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Stronger enemy, you know why? Because they're backed by God. Because it's a senseless war. And then he's going to probably try to take it out on somebody else and he's going to get disgraced. The reason why Shimei was killed and punished for per cursing King David was because he went way too far with his curses. His curses were excessive, just like King David's curses were when he cursed Joab. When the king is leprous, he loses his royal status. That's why Shimei wasn't guilty of cursing the king, because at the time he had leprosy for accepting the slander that his slave Ziva gave him about Mephobesheth. Wow. Shimei deserved to die because he cursed King David with the name of God. King David didn't kill him because he saw that Mordechai would come from him. Beautiful. An evil eye only comes to one who does evil. An evil eye only comes to one who does evil. And I'll say it one more time just to hammer it home. And e You don't want an evil eye on you. Don't do evil, bro. People are only going to give you dirty looks when you did something evil. He was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. First book of Chronicles 5.1. The same thing happened here. Achitophel told Avshalom to have relations with King David's concubines. Wow. And they listened to him. Bathsheba was the daughter of Eliam. Eliam was the son of Achitophel, the Gilonite. Bathsheba was Achitophel's granddaughter. Amazing. The same quality of arrogance which led Avshalom to rebel led him to succumb morality this is what God said to King David in front of your eyes will I take your wives and give them to the one close to you and he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun for you have acted secretly but I will do this thing to you in front of all of Israel and in front of the sun second book of Samuel 12 11 and 12 wow why because we told you that when somebody desecrates the name of God in private he will be exposed in public. King David had three enemies, Goliath, Achitophel, and Doeg the Edomite. King David was a man of war with the heart of a lion. Achitophel, although eminently wise and a Torah scholar, succumbed to his own haughtiness. Convinced that he would replace David on the throne, he mistakenly took actions that led to his being uprooted from this world and the next world. Second book of Samuel 17, 23. When Achitophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and arose and went to his house, to his city, to put his house in order. Then he strangled himself to death and was buried in his father's tomb. That's what arrogance will happen. That's what will happen to you when you have arrogance. That will be your end. You will kill yourself because Achitophel sinned with his mouth. He died by strangulation. He died at 33 as in the words of the psalmist, men of bloodshed and deception will not live out half their years. Wow. If the weather on the festival of Shavuot is clear and balmy, plant grains. The Torah was given on Shavuot and grains and proteins are known for enhancing the mental dexterity required to study Torah. Deep. Achitofel, Esa, Balak, Bilam, Haman, and the Titans from Genesis 6-4 all experience shame. Let me read that again. If the weather of the festival of Shavuot is clear and balmy, plant grains. The Torah was given on Shavuot, on Shabbat, and grains and proteins are known for enhancing the mental dexterity required to study the Torah. D. Nachash was none other than Jesse, King David's father. He was called Nachash because he had no sins. And the only reason he died was because of the sin of Adam with the serpent. I love you, Hashem. Now I'm getting into a good groove. I don't need a court of law to get my money back. I got a court of heaven to deal with that. That is a blessing for an evil person because when he's dead, it's good for him and for the world. Avshalom's hair became entangled 
in the branches and he was unable to free himself. The branches, which under normal circumstances should have broken off, did not, for heaven took note of the judgment awaiting him in the next world, such as the punishment for the son who rebels against his father. He's afflicted in heaven and on earth. Avshalom is one of the six people who got horny and died from it. Achitofa was another. Avshalom prided himself on his long, beautiful hair, and in the end he was hung by it. Deuteronomy 21, 22, when a man is legally sentenced to death and executed, you must hang them on a tree. Briefly, Avshalom had three blades thrust into his heart. The three blades represented the three hearts, which Avshalom deceived his father, the nation, and the Sanhedrin. Beautiful. He was stabbed to his heart, pinning him to an oak tree. Because Avshalom slept with the ten concubines of King David, he had ten youths strike and kill him. Man, everything is measure for measure. It's crazy, yo. Just like Achitofel, he died by strangulation. Why? Because he gave horrible advice. Go sleep with King David's concubines. That's the advice he gave. It's unbelievable how Shem is running the show. It's so deep, man. And I love it. And I want to take a break right now to tell you how much I love you, Hashem. Here it is. Hashem, I just want to say I love you so much. And I know you feel my soul and my heart attached to you always. I want to thank you for being with me always. Amen. Because Avshalom slept with 10 of King David's concubines, he was struck down by 10 youths and finally died. The verse says, and they struck Avshalom and killed him. From here we learn that they struck him in this world and killed him in the next. Wow. Yoav, a general of King David, was known for calling off the war when there was no need for unnecessary loss of life. When he knew the war was won, he immediately blew the shofar to let his fighters know to stop. One who is embarrassed by sins he committed and feels full remorse is forgiven for all his sins. Amen. Look at what happened to Avshalom. He erected a, more, a memorial tomb in the wadi of Kidron to his own honor, but was instead buried in the woods of Ephraim, covered by a mound of stone as an everlasting reminder of his shame. Only a monument intended as a focus for idol worship or as an altar for sacrifices is forbidden. Thus Avshalom did not do anything wrong when he built a monument to himself. The sin came from the pride and ego behind the monument. It is permissible to build a monument as a mausoleum to entomb the dead as Jacob did for Rachel. Beautiful. But don't spend too much money on it. You know why? Because then Rachel... If Jacob would have spent way too much money on this tomb, then she would have yelled from Shemaim, Stop! Don't waste them. Go give this money to charity. Go do a mitzvah with this money. Don't waste it on stone. You understand? But that would never happen because Jacob was already a giant. That's what happens when you fight with an angel and walk away with a broken hip. Anybody else would fight with an angel, they walk away dead. You understand? I say walk away dead. You get the point. Don't step into the water unless you know how to swim. Amen. I heard somebody uh, describe Trump with these two words, and I don't think you can find the better two words to describe him. Unpredictably predictable. <laughs> Guide me with your wisdom, Hashem. Amen. When your mouth is closed, you can never get in trouble. King David killed the Kushi because he spoke bad about his son, Achimatz. Son of Sadok said neither good or bad and was rewarded. All the more so in the reward for one who speaks favorably on behalf of Israel. All of Moses' days, he was not called the man of God until he came to bless Israel. Meaning when you say good things about Israel, it will be good for you. So let me stop and say this, Hashem. Please have mercy on your children, on the ones that do bar, bark mitzvahs, and on the ones like these two Jews in Israel that have the one ministry nation taking your kids and trying to bring them to the side of the Goyim and JC, throwing the Torah in the garbage. And you know, you know what they do, Akadish Baruch Uman. I, I feel bad even asking that you have mercy on them, but they are your children. And no matter how bad they are, they have some demon in their head that's making them do this bad, and you're feeding the pig and destroying them. And it is what it is, but it's just sad, I guess, to see Jews going on a path where they're going to get Jews to go to JC. That's really sad, demented, twisted, and psychotic because that's idol worshiping, and that's the first law. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not have any other gods. The first of the seven commandments for the Goyim, the seven laws of Noah, thou shalt not have any other gods. I am your God. That's it. It's right there, simple. And you're going to go take Jews and make them idol worship? What are you, normal? Have mercy on them also, Hashem, unless 
they don't have mercy on your children. If they're from Mushd and Ahd with just this one thing, but they do charity and they cry for the poor and they, you know, maybe do some good, then have mercy on them because they have mercy on your children. If they don't have no mercy on them, feed the pig and destroy them. Sounds cruel, but it's not. It's actually merciful because I'm having mercy on the victims, not on the criminal. You understand? It's very deep, man. Bottom line is please have mercy. And dear God, please forgive me if I ever spoke too harshly about your children. They're your children and only you have the right to rebuke and criticize them in a stern way. I could say that I hope your kids do better and even say if they don't, there'll be a punishment. But to criticize the nation of Israel in a harsh way is a no-no. Don't do it. The reason King David did not kill Shimei ben, ben Geru was because he saw that, that Tzadik Mordechai was going to come from him. I told you that before, but now I add a little bit. Mordechai was called Ish Yehudi, which means a Jew, but it can also mean a man of Judah, even though he was from the tribe of ben Benjamin. This was because King David spared him. That's beautiful. Ziva was a slave. Sorry, Ziva. Yeah, Ziva was a slave from the house of King Shaul, and he came and spoke bad about Mephobeshet. And tried to cause strife between him and King David. David accepted his slander and was punished by having his kingdom split after King Solomon's reign. Our sages say a person should pray when he grows old that his eyes should see, that his feet should walk, and that he should be able to enjoy his food. Because when old age sets in, everything goes. Amen. And I said that prayer to you, Hashem, and I say it again. Amen. After the rebellion of Avshalom, a fight broke out between the Israelites and the men of Judah. Second book of Samuel, chapter 20, verse 1. Now there happened to be a wicked man whose name was Sheva, seven, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite, who sounded the shofar and said, We have no part in David, nor have we no heritage in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. Sheva's rebellion prompted King David to send Abishai because Amasa did not return. Amasa did not return. You know why? Because he didn't want to disturb the soldiers who were studying Torah. Yoav took this as a pretext to kill him for not obeying the king. Leviticus 19.16 Do not go about as a gossip monger amongst your people. Do not stand still over your neighbor's blood. Amasa refused to kill the coin priest of Noah when King Shaul commanded him to do so. So you know who did it? Doeg the Edomite. Yoav killed Avner and Amasa. Second book of Samuel 21.1 There was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. So David inquired before God and God said to him, it's over Saul, over the house guilty of blood because he put the Gibbonites to death. Let me tell you quick who are the Gibbonites. The Gibbonites were converts who came on a pretext of deceit and tricked Joshua into believing that they came for righteous purposes. In the end, they were sanctioned to be servants of the temple. They used to be woodcutters and they would draw the water to bring it back and forth for the sacrifices and to the temple. And King David killed them when they were in Nov or cut off their supply of food because he killed the, the coin priest and everybody in the city of Nov and Shiloh. Why, why, why? What a punishment that was. You know how, man, King Shaul got killed big time with the sword. All of his sons, three of his sons got killed by the sword. Why? Why do you think? It was two, and then Ishbosheth was the other one. Because he killed all these people in the city of Nov. The high priest, the coin priest, the cattle, the sheep, everything. The nation of Israel did not give King Shaul a proper eulogy or a proper burial. He was decapitated and his head was brought to the house of the idol Dagon, who the Plishtim used to worship. And you know what's crazy? You know why they hung King Shaul in public? Initially, they weren't going to do it. But then they were reminded how the Jews killed the king of Ai. After defeating him, they hung him in public. Joshua 8.29. So they did the same to Shaul. First book of Samuel 31, 8 to 10. In the end, the body was hung in Beit Shayan and his head was brought to the royal city of the Philistine ruler where he was put in the temple of their idol Dagon. Wow. Yair means to give light. With his wisdom, he would enlighten others, including King David. A person should not give all his priestly gifts to one coin priest as this can cause a famine. The punishment is measure for measure. Since you starved all the other Kohanim priests, you too will be starved. The Talmud teaches us 
that whoever issues a ruling in, of halakha in front of his teacher or his teachers nearby deserves to be bitten by a snake. Wow, King David, that just shows you the honor and respect. It's a big thing. King David suspected that the famine was because of idolaters amongst them. As we say twice daily when reciting the Shema, beware, let your hearts be seduced and you go astray and worship other gods bowing down to them. He will lock up the sky so there will not be any rain. Deuteronomy 11, 16, and 17. Proverbs 25, 15. The person who boasts of gifts he does not give is like the clouds and wind without rain. Like that. The reason for the famine was twofold. One, King Shaul was guilty of killing the Gibbonites when he killed the citizens of Nov. And two, the nation did not bury and eulogize him properly, him and his son, Yonatan, properly. Once King Shaul was rejected by God, the people should have prayed on his behalf. When King David was forced to flee into the desert, no one came to his assistance until Barzalai the Gileadite came and brought David supplies, including food and drink. Second book of Samuel 17, 27 to 29. Because of this, the rain ceased and the land withheld its produce. That's when Jews don't have mercy on other Jews. Such is the way of God. At the time he judges a person for his sins, God also has the person's righteous deeds recalled. I love that. Beautiful. This is to show that although he succumbed to sin, in essence, he's still a righteous person. And that's really what it is. Most of the Jews are like that. They're righteous, but they have bad in them. They fall in this sin. They fall in that sin. You could see one person, he'll cheat on his wife, but he'll never steal with money. How? That's just people. That's how they are. They have good and bad. He who steals another person's livelihood takes his life. We learned this from the people of Gibeon. King Shaul never killed them, but since he killed the people of Nov who fed them, it was as if he killed them. Others say that he did kill them. Joshua 9, Joshua made them cutters of wood and drawers of water for the temple. The people of Gideon tricked Joshua into believing that they were from the tribe of Israel, but they weren't. Joshua made them woodcutters and drawers of water for the temple. The Gibeonites were the remnant of the Emorites. The proper way to rebuke a person is to always mention something good he's done. Doing so will convince him that your intention is not to condemn him, but to push him in the right direction. Beautiful. A Jew, who always, a Jew should always act with humility, mercy, and generosity. Let me say that again. A Jew should always act with humility, mercy, and generosity. King David rejected the Gibeonites to enter the nation of Israel because they harbored tremendous hate in their heart for King Shaul. King David was surprised that God would punish the house of Israel so severely because of the Gibeonites. So God told King David, if you distance those who are not close to you, you will in the end also distance those who are close to you. Seven members of the house of Shaul were hung. You know why? To show that God exacts judgment and justice. Hashem wanted to show the Goyim, look, you see, I took my own children and hung them for what King Saul did to your ancestors. Amazing. King Shaul was punished three times for three separate transgressions. He was punished for not heeding the word of God in Gilgal. That's when he failed to wait for the prophet Samuel to return. As a result of that, his kingdom was taken away and another dynasty was established on the throne. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not obeyed the commandments of the Lord your God that he commanded you. For God would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom will not endure. God has sought for himself a man who acts accordingly to his desires. And God has designated him to be the leader over the nation of Israel. First book of Samuel 13, 13 and 14. Shaul was punished for having mercy on Agag and the best of his flocks. And finally, he was punished for killing the people of Nov. He and his three sons were all murdered by the sword, as well as the fourth son, Ishbosheth. The reason why Hashem punished the nation with the famine for what they did to the Gibeonites was measure for measure since they were the ones who used to bring the water to the temple for the sacrifices. That is deep. Israel must keep its treaties just like King Solomon did with the Emirates when they made a treaty with the judges years earlier. Mephobeshet was spared by King David. Scripture states, Now Jonathan, the son of Shaul, had a son who was lame. When he was five years old, news of Shaul and Jonathan came out from Jezreel and his nursemaid picked him up, fled, and it was that in her haste to get away, he fell and became lame. His name was Mephobeshet. God took pity on Lot, Genesis 19.16. 
The reason why God took pity on Lot not was because he wasn't guilty of any of the crimes of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not because he was a Rasha and God had pity on him. Remember that. Numbers 35, 19, the blood avenger shall kill the murderer. In the first season of the harvest season, this is the 16th of Nisan, the night following the first day of Passover, and when the barley harvest begins in the land of Israel, Rabbi Hoshea said, greater is the sanctification of God's name than its desecration. When speaking of a desecration of God's name, scripture states you may not allow his body to remain on the gallows overnight, Deuteronomy 21, 23. However, with regard to the sanctification, scripture says from the start of the harvest until rain fell on them out of the heaven. From this we see that the body of Shaul's descendants remained hanging from the 16th of Nisan to the 17th of Marcheshvan, which was seven months. Yo, God avenged the honor of the Gibeonites, and they weren't even true converts. They were converts with ulterior motives. God is always with the ones that are persecuted unjustly. Like you see now that's going on with Russia and Ukraine. First book of Samuel 31, 12. David praised the valorous men of Yavish Galed for having endangered their lives to rescue the body of the king and his son from the hand of the Philistines. First book of Samuel 31, 12. David praised the valorous men of Yavesh Gilad for having endangered their lives to rescue the body of the king and his son from the hands of the Plishtim. The four sons of Arafah were Saf, Madon, Goliath, and Ishbi Benov. The Philistines who fought with King David at the end of his reign are the descendants of Orpha. She's the one who kissed her mother-in-law Naomi goodbye and returned to her people. Ruth 1.14 Wow, so Orpha, Ruth's sister, that's where all the Philistine that fought against King David came from. They descended from her. You see what happens when you don't make the right decision? If she would have made the right decision like Ruth and stuck to the Jews, she would have been blessed. But since she left the Jews, she wasn't. <laughs> Amazing. So I might be living in Israel, Hashem. Man, I love you so much. This is a long talk, but I'm happy I did it because there's so many notes for you to sit back, listen to, and enjoy. Soak up the wisdom of God and gain true happiness. Love you, Hashem.